Welcome back to Smash Ultimate. Continuing on in the city, we have Hudson Soft's mascot, Bomberman, the legendary Bomberman, who uh, continues the trend, much like Rayman, of third party characters that really should be playable fighters in this game, appearing instead as three star spirits. There is another major example of that later on as well. So, uh, yeah, Bomberman is possibly the best multiplayer game of all time in which you essentially walk around a maze with a bird's eye view of said maze uh, dropping bombs which over time will blow up taking out both your opponents and if you're dumb enough to stay in the blast zone you as well so here we have a battle where we have young link throwing lots and lots of bombs as bombermen are want to do and we also have the actual bomberman appearing as an assist trophy and throwing out the bombs that blow up in those iconic cross-shaped patterns. That said, he's uh, kind of dead now, so now, fuck, I just have to survive this explosive onslaught. There we go, use the explosions to my advantage. That is Bomberman. Honestly, one of the best goddamn video games you owe it to yourself to play if you somehow haven't. Anyway, moving on, next up we have... Doc Lewis from Punch Out! This is Little Max Coach. And he runs what may be the most important facility in the entire game. So he's being played by Little Mac, of course. And the music being played right now, the training music, is the song you hear when you watch Little Mac being trained by Doc Lewis. Granted, as you can probably gather by looking at him, he's not much of a fighter himself. He just has the know-how. He has the the spirit, the knowledge, the spunk, so... He really is a coach through and through, kind of like uh, Mickey from Rocky. Uh, I do believe he appears in the Wii version of Punch-Out as a playable opponent, but I think that's only for the training mode. And he's not particularly tricky either. Well, not until you knock his candy bar out of his hand and then he gets pissed at you. Then he gets kind of difficult. Anyway, that is Doc Lewis. That unlocks of the gym. This is the simplest of the facilities, it doesn't teach you a style, it simply levels you up. You leave your spirits there, they level up. It is a godsend, it is such a good way of uh, having spirits level up while you're not actively playing. That said, I'm very bad at remembering to leave spirits there, or get spirits out of it, so I won't have as many level 99s as I should. Anyway. This is Oil Panic. Oil Panic is one of the Game & Watch games in which you played as a mechanic in a uh, gas station who would essentially run around with buckets of oil and have to deposit those buckets of oil and at all costs avoid spilling said oil on uh, customers. That's why we were playing on that stage with customers in the background who if you attack will attack you back. But then again, I defeated them so quickly, that's kind of negligible. So, here is Subasa Uribe from Tokyo Mirage Sessions, hashtag FE. So this game is really hard to explain. It, I, it took me a while to figure out what it even was. It is a crossover of Shin Megami Tensei, so Persona, Fire Emblem, and an idol anime. And this is one of the lead protagonists of it. She can promote later into her Carnage form, which is her form where she's superpowered by the power of music. It's hard to explain. Here is Tractor Trailer from Stunt Race FX. Far easy to explain. So, uh, we talked about Stunt Race FX before. It was an SNES racing game that made use of the uh, Mode 7 chip that, you know, Star Fox is so well known for. And uh, yeah, tractor trailer is just that, a big stonking, massive ass truck. So, essentially, uh, we have the stockiest of the Koopalings riding around in his clown car to represent that. And on the Splatoon stage, which, personal opinion, is really awkward and hard to navigate, as a massive tractor would be. Anyway, here is Captain from Animal Crossing Wild World. Unlike the other Captain Spirit, where he's riding around in his boat, in Wild World, he drove a bus. So, 
Here he is as a bus driver. Now, um, annoyingly, this leads to one of the more annoying assist trophies appearing, which is Cap'n himself driving around in his bus, which, if you get caught in it, will most likely just drive you off the edge of the stage. You can shake out of it, but if you're unlucky enough to get caught near an edge, you, you, for fuck's sake, you are just dead, so... Fuck off, Captain! You scallywag! You scurvy dog! There he is. That gives us the dash attack, because his assist trophy, as it appears in this game, you know, kills you by running into you. And now we can drive that bus from earlier! Fantastic! So, uh... Kind of like with the, um, bridges. I'm just gonna go straight there. Let's go ride a bus. After a short dash. There we are. All the way across the map. Eventually there will be, like, little checkpoints everywhere that allow me to warp around more quickly. But in the meantime, we have to do a big run. All to get taken to the other side of the map. Back to that village from before, so... Who this be? Who this spirit be after all that time? Isabel! The cutest of the characters! Yeah, that's right, Pichu, I said it. So, Isabel is your secretary in Animal Crossing New Leaf. She is a... Shiba Inu? Is she? No, she's a Shih Tzu, sorry. She's a Shih Tzu. And she's just cute as hell, and she has a massive crush on your player character, regardless of gender, so... By icon, Isabel. Anyway, um... She debuted in Smash Ultimate, not as an echo of Villager, as many people expected her to be, but as a whole new character with a unique moveset, so... That threw a lot of people, and, uh... As you may be seeing later, I am terrible with her. I have no idea how to use her effectively. We all have our blind spots, so... Cool, that opens up that little path. So I, uh, might as well just... You know, I'm just gonna take the bus back, why not? And here we are, back at the village, or city, whatever the hell this place is, with its game cubes and its game console looking buildings. Here's the Inkling, the first character revealed for Super Smash Ultimate. So Inklings are the uh, main species appearing in the Splatoon series. A series where sea folk basically come to land and thrive off of ink as opposed to water. To the point where if you put Splatoon, Splatoon? If you put the Inkling into a uh, body of water in Smash Ultimate, it actually starts losing health. So yeah, keep them away from water, they don't like it. Anyway, um, they have a bunch of uh, long range and ink based moves, which are good for racking up damage quickly, and finishing off opponents by putting them in uh, unenviable buried positions. So yeah, they can be quite frustrating to deal with. As someone who never played Splatoon, I've never really had much of a play with them. But I have had my ass kicked by many Inklings in my time, so... Good character. Pretty damn good. In fact, I believe they're generally considered to be top tier. I think because of the berry attack. The fact that they could just bury you in the ground and insta-kill you from there. So yeah. Anyway, they come in a bunch of different varieties. That's just your standard Inkling. We'll be seeing more of them later. Anyway, back in Nintendo City, our next spirit is Kyle Hyde from Hotel Dusk, Room 215. This was a point-and-click adventure game for the Nintendo DS. There were many of those, actually. It kind of came as a given, given the nature of the DS and the touchscreen elements. But, um, yeah, he was a former detective, and he finds himself in a mysterious hotel room. Where, uh, yeah, supernatural shit goes on, and that is why we have a battle against Snake, a very standard, realistic, gruff-looking man. And we also have, you know, Foresight and the Fog to represent a more 
bizarre supernatural setting. Uh, oh. Wow, that was... <laughs> that looked amazing. <laughs> that very slow punch getting parried. That was kind of the dopest thing ever. I'm definitely going to try and Falcon Punch you, despite not being able to see you. Fuck you. I'm Get over here. I'm going to punch you so good. Alright, that'll do. Whatever. Good enough. There's Kyle Hyde for you. Alright, so... Another little level up for Captain Rainbow. Gotta love it. And continuing on, our next spirit is Twintel from the ARM series. So Twintel is one of the ARMS fighters who fights with her hair, much like Bayonetta does, hence why we have Bayonetta playing her. And if the cup of tea in her hands is anything to go by, she's also quite a classy lady, so... That makes the casting all the more appropriate. Anyway, as far as ARMS characters goes, she is apparently the most popular as voted for by fans, so... Yeah, if we were going to get any ARMS representative other than the Spring Man, it would most likely be Twintel here. But, uh, given the fact that they appear in the, uh, you know, World of Light campaign, chances are they're probably not going to appear as DLC. Don't quote me on that later, I don't want to look silly in the future. Thank you. And there is Twintel, that buffs our air defense, which, you know, that's kind of a given considering that you have big flailing fists attached to your hair. I can imagine it's quite hard to get an aerial attack on you, so here is Yama. Yama is a uh, company boss, and he also serves as the mascot of Sim Tower SP, or as it's known in some regions, just the Tower SP. I guess they wanted to be uh, uh, dissociated from the Sim series. But anyway, uh, Sim Tower was a game in which you basically owned a skyscraper and all of the homes and businesses found within. Hence why we have this uh, Tomodachi stage, which itself is basically a skyscraper. And we also have the strong winds to represent the, uh, you know, difficulties that your tower could face. Because like in most of the Sim games, natural disasters were a thing that could screw you over. So yeah. Anyway, uh, that was a nice quick easy victory with a dope looking finishing shot and Yama helps boost our aura, so fantastic. Alrighty, so moving on from there we have Roger the Potted Ghost, one of the bosses from Super Mario 2 Yoshi's Island. This boss was a real war of attrition because the boss itself was stationary and would just fire projectiles at you. And what you really had to do was push him off of an edge while he himself was being pushed by a pair of shy guys. Hence why we have a big Wii Fit trainer who does not move. And we have uh, two Meta Knights playing the shy guys. They're kind of scrubbing up their job though because they really should be uh, saving their potted ghost friend and not letting me wail on him like that. 2 out of 10. Do a better job next time guys, come on. You have a ghost to look after. Anyway, uh, carrying on. Oh, there's nothing else up here, so I shall proceed downward. We have Detective Pikachu, the protagonist of the 3DS game of the same name, and also, to date, the best video game adaptation film ever made. Just beating out Prince of Persia. So, Ready? yeah, this is a Pikachu who could talk. Or at least it was able to be understood by the uh, main protagonist of that game. And uh, to represent the fact that he is in fact a detective and a Pikachu, we have a battle where there are a bunch of detective Pikachus and you have to use your context clues and you have to keep an eye out for the correct one and make sure you take out the correct one because if you waste too much time going for the wrong ones, you're gonna lose. So yeah, kind of like those ball in a cup games, but with Pikachu zipping all over the goddamn place. And yes, I have already lost which one is the one I'm targeting. It was that one, apparently. Anyway, the key, if you do lose track of the real one, is to look at the percentage meters. So, 
Yeah, Detective Pikachu, as a spirit, gives you fog immunity because he can see through the fog. He can, you know, solve the case. It's a, it's a metaphor for being a detective. Anyway, there's Luigi's hat. Let's continue. Here is Sebastian Tute. He is the mascot of Wii Music. So, uh, Wii Music was a game that existed. You played music with your friends by waving around the Wiimote like a conductor. So, representing the musical element of that game, we have Meloetta the Pokemon appearing to attack me with music notes. Sebastian Toot himself is just some sword guy. And he doesn't know how to text, so he's dead now. God, can you remember the reveal of Wii Music? What an utter train wreck that was. God damn. Oh boy. Anyway, it's time to get edgy. Here is Infinite from Sonic Forces. So Infinite is a jackal mercenary who is uh, hired by Eggman and becomes one of his most powerful pawns because he wields the Phantom Ruby from Sonic Mania. The Phantom Ruby allows him to fight with illusions and create illusory clones of Sonic's former enemies. And uh, this particular fight with him, fuck, that's disorienting, uh, represents the conflict with him at Capital City, in which he would basically mess with the stage and throw illusions all over the goddamn place and try to disorient you while you were running down a very um, industrial area. Hence why we've got an F-Zero track that's being flipped over, and god damn is, if that isn't really annoying to deal with. God damn, Infinite. So, uh, yeah. I will say, as far as characters go, I kind of admire that Sega is still willing to make a character that is just 100% edgelord. Like, no irony to him, he's just full-on edgelord, and I kind of love him for it. Like, there's just no shame to him. He would most definitely appeal to all of Sonic's angsty teenage fans, and I dig that. We don't get enough of that from Shadow nowadays. Anyway, fuck you, Infinite. <laughs> you dodged my thing. How dare you. Dodge this. Fuck you, he dodged again. Oh, he's making a right fool of me. Um, fuck. I'm nearly dead. Yeah. Upwards thunder. There we go. That's what you get, Infinite. <laughs> you get electrocuted, but upside down somehow. I don't think that's how electricity works. Anyway. Here is Pauline. Alright. Super Smash Bros. Ultimate is my favourite video game. I consider it to be the best game I've ever played. This is the worst part of it. This fight is fucking atrocious. I hate it with a burning passion. The stage is awful. The gimmick is so fucking awful. Everything about this battle is bad. Look. Mm, fuck. Shit. Fuck. I just want to die. Why? No. Fuck. Shit. Oh, go fuck yourself. A battle where your opponent constantly runs away from you and there's a time limit? That's already bad. The stage is not even navigatable because it's not designed for a fighting game and should not be in Smash Brothers. I'm sorry. I'm no Final Destination purist, but this stage sucks shit. And fuck me, the fact you're being attacked from three directions, or you're being attacked from two directions while you're trying to deal with a third opponent is just, oh, it's so aggravating. Fuck, it's so easy to fall and die on this. Everything about this is just dreadful and it's infamous. This fight is infamous. It is hated by most Smash players and thankfully it is optional. You can just walk around it but this is a 100% playthrough so I guess I'll just wait for the AI to fuck up. Even the AI can't handle that awful stage and ended up committing suicide on it so hey. Thanks Pauline. God damn. Alright, it's all uphill from there. It only gets better from there. Next battle over here for the chest is against deep breathing, which after that last battle, I could do with some deep breathing. That would that sounds really nice right about now. 
So, this is a battle against a bunch of Wii Fit trainers who will continually do some deep breathing exercises. Which sounds all well and good, except for the fact that said exercises does buff their attack power. So yeah, you all dead now. Get knocked off the hedge. Again, no battle is difficult when you can walk off the hedge. That still remains to be true. So, what we got here? What this be? Skill spheres! Nice! 20 of them! Oh, you spoil me, game. I will uh, make use of those later. There is a button over there. There's nothing down here, so let's go hit the button. What does this button do? It opens the gate! Ah, there we are. And another gate! Cool, now I can actually get across this map in a quick and effective fashion. Oh, thank goodness. I actually needed to hit that button way earlier. So, let us uh, push on then. Next battle is against the Eon Pokemon of Generation 3, Latias and Latios. These were a pair of Dragon and Psychic type Pokemon. They basically ruled the skies, or like to fly around in the skies, since Rayquaza rules the skies. And uh, yeah, in the original Gen 3 games, they were both roaming Pokemon. Which means that they could appear anywhere in the game, but if you encountered them, they would immediately run away. They were borderline uncatchable unless you were specifically hunting for them with the right loadout. So, in the Gen 6 remakes, they were made far more generous. They were just a battle that you couldn't avoid. It was a mandatory battle, and upon capturing or defeating them, they became your form of fast travel, allowing you to fly at any time. I don't know how I won that. I'm pretty sure... I, I don't think I won that. I shouldn't have won that. I'm pretty sure you hit me and not vice versa. But I'm maybe the attack that he used to hit me was just enough to knock him off the edge. I don't know. Don't know what happened there. Here is a pocket football player. So this is a football player as appearing in the Calcabit games. A bunch of sports gamers where he played as cute little sprite people. There's not much more to him than that. So we have a bunch of tiny villagers who, uh, when they spawn, will start kicking footballs at me. There they are. There are the balls. I like how the Pokemon Stadium is a good stand-in for a football stadium. And, uh, yeah, take that. One thing I do particularly like about this battle is that there's also 11 of them, which is standard for, you know, association football. 11 aside football. Not counting any of the benched players, of course, but yeah. Anyway, um, time for you to get Aurasphered, motherfuckers. I care not for your fucking footballs. Get owned. Well, I have football and I have Dragon Ball Z. There we are. Oh, one more. Get destroyed. And those are the pocket football players. Nice. Simple. Not much more to them than that. So, moving on once again, our next battle is against Piston Hondo. So Piston Hondo is one of the fighters from the Punch-Out series. And uh, yeah, well, both Punch-Out and Street Fighter have you fight against gross, gross stereotypes of different nationalities. In case you couldn't guess, Piston Hondo is Japanese. So yeah, anyway, um... Yeah, he's being played by a Mac. He's quite big because he's the first fighter in the game who kind of towers over you and gives you a real challenge. But not so much in this. Not when I'm playing as the unkillable Sagat. Yeah, I told you that raising Sagat would be a good idea. Because uh, it's quite easy to steamroll enemies with him. I will, I'll try not to abuse him. Here are the chorus kids. So... Uh, appearing in the Rhythm Heaven minigame, Glee Club, the chorus kids were a group of three kids who sing as a chorus. Generally, two of them will sing a note, and then you, playing as the third one, 
we'll have to sing the third note within rhythm of the other two. So yeah, simple as that really. Um, although there is occasionally like a little built-in joke where your voice will be significantly louder and more powerful than the others. Like making you quite stand out. And uh, that is why we have three Jigglypuffs of differing size to represent the three different notes that they sing. With the big one, assumingly representing the big bassy note. And fuck, I hate Jigglypuff sing. <laughs> fuck off with that. Get out of it. I'm gonna bows you right in the face. And skadoosh. Get done. Oh, nearly there. Not quite though. Fuck me, there's one Jigglypuff. There he is. Couldn't hold out that much longer. It is Jigglypuff. The weakest character in the game by quite a margin. Don't at me. He is. <laughs> anyway, um, Smash Bros. Hot Takes aside, let's push on towards the next spirit, who is... Spectre Spectanite. So appearing in Shovel Knight as one of the members of the Order of No Quarter. Uh, Spectre Knight used to be a thief named Donovan, but has since passed and become the Spectral Knight that he is. He is... Incredibly dedicated to the Enchantress, uh, very, very loyal to her. And you actually do play as him in uh, Spectre of Torment, a prequel campaign which shows you just how he helped to form the Order. And out of all the knights in the game, he's the only one who's kind of a jerk to you. A very rude dude. This is Captain Cuttlefish from Splatoon. He is something of a mentor character and the grandfather of both Callie and Marie in the first game. So, uh, yeah, he's an old squid man. And I kind of love what they've done for a costume here. They don't have a dedicated Captain Cuttlefish costume. So they've gone for Vincent Van Gogh's head with the beard intact and everything and Skull Kid's clothing. They really did kind of mix and match for this one. And I got to respect that. You could easily have just had him played by an inkling, but that'd have been too easy, so here he is. Um, he does have a gym himself, which we'll be seeing as soon as I've taken him out. Skadoosh. And uh, this gym, as, you know, evidenced by the fact that he is a character from Splatoon, it teaches you the land style, so the ability to fight on land but not so well in the air, or in the sea, in Captain Cuttlefish's case, since all the sea folk now live on land. Anyway, here are some more Fatal Frame characters, Mio and Maya Amakura. They appear in the PS2 exclusive, Fatal Frame 2 Crimson Butterfly. In said game, said butterflies lure them into a ghost village full of horrible fucking ghosties and you have to do that standard take pictures of them with the ghost camera and scare the shit out of David so he never wants to play it again. Fuck I'm bad at playing those games. Anyway, unlike the last battle this one's not quite as difficult. Yes there are two of them, but in keeping with the survival horror protagonist they spend this whole battle just running away from you and trying to, you know, avoid you. Much like you are one of the ghosties yourself. Hence why I thought it would be fitting to play as the Shadow Queen, because she kind of is a ghost. Quite good casting, if I may say so myself. So, get donked. Oh, and uh, I'm going to donk you out before I get attacked by the actual camera. There we go, that reduces our poison damage. I can think of a myriad of reasons why that's fitting, but there you go. I assume there's a lot of poisoning in that game. Anyway, um, there's not really much else over here, so how about down this way? Aha, we have Top Man. Appearing in Mega Man 3, Top Man is one of the Robot Masters. Can you guess his gimmick? If you haven't already watched that one Unraveled video about all the Robot Masters. He's a planetary explorer. His job is to go to space, and also he is a top for some reason. Why the fuck is he a top? I guess it's something to do with like centrifugal force or 
something like that? Don't get that decision. I don't know why he's a top. I'm sorry, Brian. I can't, I can't answer that for you. So, yeah. Anyway, relatively easy battle there. And, uh, wow, I'm really coming back on myself. I think it's actually time for us to head towards the next dungeon. So, using Otacon's hacking skills, we can break into the base. But not before taking out a few more spirits, or one more spirit. Here is Sigma. Sigma is the main antagonist of the Mega Man X series. He was once a revered reploid, you know, like a robot cop. But eventually, he went maverick and became hell-bent on humanity's destruction, forcing Mega Man X to uh, turn on his old leader. I actually watched a, an AMV released with one of the Mega Man PSP games, and it was called The Day of Sigma, and it was literally just an animated retelling of Sigma's descent into evil, and I would highly recommend it. Even if you don't like Mega Man, it's a really good watch. I very much liked it. I got a kick out of it. It's on YouTube. Anyway, this is a fucking hard battle, which I can attest to the fact that Sigma is hard, because having played Mega Man X, he kicks the shit out of me anytime I encounter him. It takes me a good few whacks to finally beat him. Thankfully, we had Sagat, so it was Capcom versus Capcom. And, uh... Speaking of, here's Mega Man! The Blue Bomber himself. So... Yeah, Mega Man, created by Dr. Light, is a robot who has the ability to steal powers and utilize powers from other robot masters, which, given the fact that more often than not, he finds himself taking down armies of them, benefits him quite well. That said, Dr. Light is a huge pacifist, so after any given Mega Man game, Mega Man is always depowered and reset back to neutral. But, uh, yeah, if he had any sense, he would keep Mega Man as the, uh, all-powerful, super versatile killing machine that he appears as in Smash Bros, since in Smash, most of his moveset is taken from different Robot Masters. Yeah, he has his own standard Mega Buster with you know, with his standard A attack and his charge shot with the smash attack, but yeah, most of his B moves, most of his air moves, yeah, they're uh, straight up stolen from different robot masters, some of which we've already defeated, so yeah. Also, his up A is the Shoryuken, which he does do in certain Mega Man games, and uh, considering I'm playing as Sagat, I like to think that's kind of an insult, hence why I had to destroy him. Using that goddamn move on me. Do you know where I got this fucking scar from? Anyway, um, that is Mega Man dealt with. There is a treasure chest filled with Ray Mark II from Custom Robo. And uh, from there, before we hit the base, I am going to start spending some of these Sphere Grid points because I always forget to do this. Uh, let's go for... Thinking about an upcoming battle. I think I'll leave it. I'll leave it for now. I'll wait until I can save up for something better. But another thing I'll do is do a bit of summoning. So, by combining those two Fatal Frame girls with Young Cricket, the Kung Fu Boy from WarioWare, we get a pair of Kung Fu Boys. Whether or not they have to deal with supernatural horrors, I don't really know. Uh, because they're more known for their appearance in Street Fighter 3. They are Yun and Yang. See you soon.